Let's bow our heads for prayer. Father in heaven, once again we come before your throne pleading for divine help. For we cannot trace the meaning of your word without the aid of the Spirit who inspired that word in the first place. Father, signs of the times are everywhere. People know that momentous things are happening in this world. Things such as we have never seen before. Things that show that the close of probation and the coming of Jesus is even at the door. We're thankful for that because we look forward with longing for the coming of Jesus. We ask, Father, that you will bless us in our study this morning. And we thank you for hearing our prayer. For we plead in the precious name of your beloved Son, Jesus Christ. Amen. I would like us to go back in our minds to the time of the flood. The universal flood in the days of Noah. In Genesis chapter 6 and verse 5 and verses 11 and 12, we find a description of the wickedness of the world before the flood. We find there in Genesis 6 and verse 5 the following words. Then the Lord saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth and that every intent of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. Notice the expressions. The wickedness was great. Every intent of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. And then verses 11 and 12 tell us what the result was in society. Verse 11 states, the earth was also corrupt before God, and the earth was filled with violence. So God looked upon the earth, and indeed it was corrupt, for all flesh had corrupted their way on the earth. What could have led the world to reach this condition in only approximately 1,600 years since creation. Genesis chapter 6 explains the reason why. It tells us that the sons of God, which represents the righteous, saw that the daughters of men were beautiful, which basically means that the righteous began to intermingle with the unrighteous. And let me tell you something, very rarely is it the case when a righteous person joins an unrighteous person in marriage that the unrighteous person becomes righteous. Once in a while it will happen, but very seldom. And so it was the union of the faithful and the unfaithful, the righteous with the unrighteous, according to Genesis 6, 1 through 4, that led to the corruption of the world, to the demoralization of the world. But God had a remnant, a faithful remnant, small in the context of the millions that undoubtedly lived in the world at that time. In fact, the remnant, when the flood came, was composed of only eight people. Now, between creation and the flood, approximately 1,656 years had transpired. How many people were living in the world at that time? Men lived to be almost 1,000 years old. How many children can a 1,000-year-old man have? Actually, 969, Methuselah. You know, when they were 300 years old, they were just teenagers. <laughs> there was no scarcity of resources. There was very little disease, according to the spirit of prophecy. The world was in its pristine glory. Very little did you see the effects of sin. There must have been millions of people living on planet Earth. There was a faithful remnant. 
Let's read about that faithful remnant in Genesis chapter 6 and verse 9, and then we'll read chapter 7 and verse 1. Genesis 6 verse 9 says, this is the genealogy of Noah. Noah was a just man, perfect in his generations. Noah walked with God. And then let's notice chapter 7 verse 1, Then the Lord said to Noah, Come into the ark, you and all your household, because I have seen that you are righteous before me in this generation. So God had a small remnant that walked with him and was righteous. And God called Noah to be his messenger to the world. And God established a period, a clearly defined period of probation. Notice Genesis chapter 6 and verse 3. Genesis chapter 6 and verse 3 describes the period of probation during which Noah preached righteousness. It says there, And the Lord said, My spirit shall not strive with man forever. In other words, the door of mercy is not going to be open indefinitely. For he is indeed flesh. Yet his days shall be 120 years. This was the probationary period for the antediluvian race. And during this period, God called Noah to preach a message of righteousness. In fact, in 2 Peter chapter 2 and verse 5, we're told that Noah was a preacher of righteousness. He said to the antediluvian world, God is a God of mercy, He's a God of love, He's willing to forgive. But through His power, must, you must straighten out your lives. You must live righteous lives. Now the message of Noah was accompanied by the power of the Holy Spirit. Because God said, My spirit shall not strive always with man, but he will strive for 120 years. So the message of Noah was a message that was accompanied by the power of God's Holy Spirit. It was also a message of judgment. His preaching was a preaching of judgment. And you say, how do you know that? You know, the word strive that is used there in Genesis chapter 6, my spirit shall not always strive with men. Most of the time, the time that that word appears in the Old Testament, it's the Hebrew word dun, pretty close to doom, only an N on the end, dun, most of the time is translated judgment. In other words, the Holy Spirit, through Noah, was preaching a message of judgment where people had to decide to be on one side or on the other. In other words, his message had the purpose of polarizing society. He preached through the power of the Holy Spirit, and his message was a message of judgment because it divided the world into two groups. Now Noah not only preached, he showed that he believed his message. Because we're told in Hebrews chapter 11 and verse 7 that he built an ark. Every hammer blow on the ark was an evidence that Noah believed what he was preaching. You see, if he'd only preached, people would say, hey, what are you going to do about it? Noah says, I believe what I preach. It's going to rain. And he built an ark to prove that he believed what he was preaching. And by the way, he was building this ark on dry ground. Now, Noah's message was contrary to historical, scientific, sensorial, and rational information. In other words, his message of a universal flood was preposterous because before the flood, it had never rained. The Bible tells us that the earth was watered by a sort of automatic sprinkler system. The Bible says that a mist would come up from the earth and water the earth. You see, at creation, God placed water above and he placed water below the earth. 
above so that there would be a uniform climate, kind of a greenhouse, and below so that the earth could be watered. So it had never rained. And so Noah brings this message that it's going to rain. Absurd, ridiculous. Who would ever think that water could fall from heaven and totally flood the world? I like to use my imagination and think what academia had to say about Noah's message. Let's imagine the Department of Natural Sciences. I can hear the experts saying, it has never rained before. Everything has continued as from the beginning, as it says in 2 Peter. It would be unscientific to believe that water could fall from heaven and fill the earth. I like to imagine what the theologians must have been saying. God loves the world too much to destroy it. Besides, rain from heaven would require a miracle, and nature works and on the basis of natural laws. See, they were, these were liberal theologians. <laughs> I like to think what the history department of academia would say. There is no historical record of any flood in the past. So why should we believe that there is going to be one now? I like to think what the behavioral sciences department must have said. Noah is suffering from an imaginary mental delusion. He is confusing reality with fantasy. He is mentally deranged. I like to think what the sociology department of that university must have said. We must not allow a lunatic like Noah to interrupt the stable order of society. Noah was, was probably looked upon as peculiar, sectarian, and perhaps even as a cultist. I like to think what the philosophers must have said. Noah is suffering because of an existential void in his life. <laughs> What's true for Noah is not necessarily true for everyone else. The bottom line is that when Noah finished his preaching, all of the world was divided into two groups. And there were only eight people faithful to God. You know, that is a sobering thought. The minority has always been with God. The majority has not been with God. People think that because their church is the largest church, that that has to be the true church. Not necessarily. Because God has always dealt with minorities because the minority are the ones who want to accept and follow his ways. And so Noah preached his message 120 years. I'd like to imagine what, a mess, what it must have been like when the 120 years of probation came to an end and Noah stood at the door of the ark pleading with people to come in and take refuge from the flood that was going to come. All they did was mock and make fun of him. So Noah and his family entered the ark. And I want you to notice what happens next. Probation comes to a close when the door of the ark closes. Notice Genesis chapter 7 and verse 16. Genesis chapter 7 and verse 16. Noah has finished preaching his message and we're told there, So those that entered, male and female of all flesh, went in as God had commanded him, and the Lord shut him in. Who closed the door? God closed the door when probation came to an end, when preaching came to an end. I like to read the description that Ellen White provides because she saw this in vision of the closing of the door. Patriarchs and Prophets, page 98. She expressed it this way. The massive door, which is what it was impossible for those within to close, was slowly swung to its place by unseen hands. 
Noah was shut in, and the rejectors of God's mercy were shut out. And now she says, the seal of heaven was on that door. Were those inside sealed? Yes, they were. The seal of heaven was on that door. God had shut it, and God alone could open it. And so when the door shut, immediately it started to rain. No, it did not. How long passed between when the door closed and when it began to rain? The Bible tells us that it was a period of seven days that went by. Let's read it in Genesis chapter 7 and verse 10. Genesis chapter 7 verse 10. It says, And it came to pass after seven days that the waters of the flood were on the earth. In other words, between the closing of the door and when the destruction came by the rain, a period of seven days transpired. How do you suppose Noah and his family felt inside the ark during those seven days? Day one passes, no flood. Day two, three, four, five, six, no flood. Do you think their faith was tested? How do you think the people outside the ark behaved? Do you think they became more violent and mocking with each passing day? See, Noah was crazy. In fact, let me read you from Patriarchs and Prophets, page 98 and 99, about the attitude of those inside and those outside the ark. It says, For seven days after Noah and his family entered the ark, there appeared no sign of the coming storm. During this period, their faith was tested. It was a period of testing of faith for those inside the ark. She continues saying, it was a time of triumph for the world without. Although the triumph was very limited and short. She continues saying the apparent delay confirmed them in the belief that Noah's message was a delusion and that the flood would never come. And on page 99, speaking about those outside the ark, she says they gathered in crowds about the ark deriding its inmates with a daring violence which they had never ventured upon before. And then immediately after, she makes this comment about what is going to happen at the end of the world. I'm going to get ahead of myself just a little bit. I'm going to read her statement about how the flood event parallels what's going to happen. She continues saying on page 99, So, when Christ shall cease the in, his intercession for guilty men, before his coming in the clouds of heaven, the door of mercy will be shut. What is going to happen before Jesus comes? The door of mercy will be shut. And then she says, then divine grace will no longer restrain the wicked. And Satan will have full control of those who have rejected mercy. We have no idea what this world is going to be like when it's totally under the control of Satan. Of course, he will not have control of God's people. You need to come for to tonight's lecture. We're going to talk about the story of Job. God's people will suffer, but they will not die. And so she says, then divine grace will no longer restrain the wicked and Satan will have full control of those who have rejected mercy. They will endeavor to destroy God's people. But as Noah was shut into the ark, so the righteous will be shielded by divine power. You see, Jesus will no longer be intercessor, but he will be protector. Jesus is not going to forsake his people on earth when he closes the ministration in the sanctuary. After all, he said, Lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the world. Exactly. And then after seven days, suddenly, the people hear thunder, and they see 
lightning. And the sky starts getting dark. And these unidentified flying objects called clouds <laughs> begin appearing on the horizon. And suddenly drops of rain begin falling from the sky. I can't even imagine how their hearts must have sunk. Noah was right. What is historically, scientifically, sensorially impossible is happening. And the Bible speaks about this as a cataclysmic event that totally demolished planet Earth. In fact, in Genesis chapter 7 and verse 11, we find the description, it says that the great fountains of the deep were broken open. And the windows of heaven were open, and water, torrents of water came from above and from below. You know, in the New Testament, there's a normal word for flood. It's the word potamos. But whenever the flood in Noah's day is referred to, a different word is used. Only for the flood in Noah's day, a special word is used in Greek. It's the word kataklismos. What word do we get in English from cataclysmos? Cataclysm. By the way, there's a special word for the flood in the Old Testament too that is used for the flood in Noah's day, the word mabul. There are many words for flood in Hebrew, but there's one special one that is used for the flood in Noah's day. This was a worldwide catastrophe. You know, as I looked on television at what happened in Japan, it was surreal, wasn't it? I mean, seeing that tsunami come in and just totally take away everything. Wow, it, it's like you're watching so, some Hollywood movie. But that was a local, a local tsunami and a local earthquake. Imagine in Noah's day, it was a global conflagration. Allow me to read you, Patriarchs and Prophets, page 99. Ellen White saw in vision what happened. She says, rivers broke away from their boundaries and overflowed the valleys. Jets of water burst from the earth with indescribable force, throwing massive rocks hundreds of feet into the air. And these, in falling, buried themselves deep in the ground. She continues saying, as the violence of the storm increased, Trees, buildings, you could almost see uh, this illustrated in the tsunami on a local level. She says, trees, buildings, rocks, and earth were hurled in every direction. The terror of man and beast was beyond description. Above the roar of the tempest was heard the wailing of a people that had despised the authority of God. And then the Bible tells us that the earth returned to the condition it was in before creation week. Filled with water, dark, and no living inhabitant upon the earth. Some people ask, what happened with Satan during the flood? He was getting wet. Patriarchs and Prophets, page 99. Did he lose all of his power base? What is the devil's power base? His people. Did he lose all of his people? All of his people died. He lost his power base. Page 99 of Patriarchs and Prophets, Ellen White, who saw this in vision, said, Satan himself, who was compelled to remain in the midst of the warring elements, feared for his own existence. What kind of cataclysm it must have been that the devil, uh, the devil actually feared for his own existence. You know, there's one other time that the devil is going to be in a situation like that, and that is during the millennium. Jeremiah said that the earth will be without form and void, and he beheld no man on earth. Once again, the devil will be bound to planet Earth in a chaotic and disorderly state. Now let's notice what Jesus had to say about the flood. 
Matthew 24, 37 to 39. You see, what we've studied so far is really a type or an illustration of what's going to happen at the end of time. Jesus himself said so. Matthew 24, verse 37, and we'll read through verse 39. It says here, But as the days of Noah were, so also will the coming of the Son of Man be. For as in the days before the flood, they were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage. And now notice a very important little temporal word, a time word. They were doing this until the day that Noah, what? Entered the ark. Verse 39. And did not know until, again a temporal word, time word, until the flood came and took them all away so also will the coming of the Son of Man be. Did Jesus see a parallel between what happened at the flood and what will happen in relationship to a second coming? Absolutely. Now did you notice that the word until is used twice? The first until marks the moment when they entered the ark. Until Noah entered the ark. The second until marks when it began to what? When it began to rain. They did not know until the flood came and took them all away. How much time was there in between those two untils? Seven days. Is that correct? We already studied it. Seven days between the first until and the second until. Did you notice that it says that they did not know something during those seven days? They did not know until the flood came. Now the question is, what didn't they know until the flood came? They did not know that they were what? They did not know that they were lost. Let me ask you this. When were the wicked lost? When the door closed or when it started to rain? When the door closed. Did the door close before it started to rain? Yes. Was there a period of tribulation for those who were inside the ark during those seven days? Was it a time of triumph for those outside of the ark? Absolutely. Those outside... They did not even know that they were lost during that period until the flood came and took them all away. So will the coming of the Son of Man be. Is it just possible that probation is going to close before Jesus comes? Absolutely. Now, we're studying this series on the sanctuary. We've taken a look at the flood, we've taken a look at Matthew chapter 24, but now we want to see that this whole idea of probation closing and then destruction coming actually needs to be understood within the context of the sanctuary. And to find that context, we must go to the book of Revelation. Go with me to Revelation chapter 14, verses 6 and 7. Revelation chapter 14 and verses 6 and seven. Does God have an end time message for the world like he had a message in the days of Noah? Absolutely. It's found in Revelation 14 verses 6 and 7. You know that passage. You have it memorized, don't you? Three angels' messages given to the world. First angel's message says, fear God, give glory to him, for the hour of his what? Of his judgment has come, and worship him who made the heavens, the earth, the seas, and the fountains of waters. So does God have a message to the world that the world needs to fear God and give glory to God because the hour of God's judgment has come? Absolutely. Is this God's final message to the world? Yes, because immediately after the three angels' message, Jesus is seen seated on a cloud and he has a sickle in his hand and he's coming back to the earth. Will this message be accompanied by the power of the Holy Spirit? Absolutely. You say, how do we know that? It's very simple. After the three angels' messages, the Bible tells us that the harvest of the earth is ripe and the grapes of the earth are ripe immediately afterwards. What was it in the Bible that ripened the harvest? The latter rain. And what does the latter rain represent? It represents the Holy Spirit. So is this message accompanied by the power of the Holy Spirit and matures the world into two groups? Yes. 
You have those who have the seal of God and those who receive what? The mark of the beast as a result of the message. The world will be divided into two groups. So is the end time message a message of judgment? Yes. Is it a global message? Absolutely. Is it accompanied by the power of the Holy Spirit? Yes. What will happen when the message has been proclaimed? The door of mercy will close. Can we now come in faith to the heavenly sanctuary and in repentance and in faith confessing our sins? Can we have the assurance that Jesus receives our sins and he cleanses us from all unrighteousness? Can we have that assurance today? Is Jesus ministering as high priest in the sanctuary? We've studied this, right? Is the day coming when he's not going to minister as the high priest anymore? Revelation 15, the very next chapter after the message. Revelation 15, and let's read beginning at verse 5. Revelation 15, verse 5. Intercession is going to close. Now we're in a sanctuary context. It says there, in Revelation 15, verse 5, After these things I looked, and behold, the temple, we've already identified as the most holy place. The word naos in Revelation means the most holy place. After these things I looked, and behold, the temple of the most holy place of the tabernacle of the testimony. The tabernacle is the total structure. The temple is the most holy place. Was opened. You say, oh, well, the sanctuary is open, so everybody can come in and be saved. No, no, the purpose of opening the sanctuary here is not to let people in, but to let the plague angels out. Notice what it continues saying, verse 6. And out of the temple, that's once again the most holy place, came the seven angels having the seven plagues clothed in pure linen and having their chests girded with golden bands. Then one of the four living creatures gave to the seven angels seven golden bowls full of the wrath of God who lives forever and ever. The temple, now listen carefully, the temple, once again the same word, now it's most holy place. The temple was filled with smoke from the glory of God and from his power. And no one was able to enter the temple till the seven plagues of the seven angels were completed. Is the ministration in the most holy place going to come to an end? It is. Are people going to be able to enter there and bring their sins to Jesus for forgiveness and cleansing? No. The Bible tells us that a time is coming when we will not be able to enter. The temple will be open in order for the angels to come out and pour out God's wrath like he did at the time of the flood. You know, it's interesting, immediately after speaking about the closing of the ministration here in Revelation 15, do you know what you find in the very next chapter, chapter 16? You find the plagues and the tribulation. Are you with me? You have seven plagues. That's before the coming of Jesus. The temple ministry closes, seven plagues. There's a period before Jesus comes. Finally, when you get to chapter 19 of Revelation, there you have the second coming of Jesus. The Bible tells us that he's seated on a white horse. And the armies of heaven are with him. And he's coming to pick up his people. That's the second coming. And so Revelation has this pattern. The proclamation of the message, Revelation 14. The closing of the ministration in the sanctuary in chapter 15. The period of tribulation and the plagues, chapter 16, and the arrival of Jesus Christ at his second coming after the tribulation in chapter 19. So is there going to be a period between the close of probation and the coming of Jesus? Absolutely. You know, most Christians think that they can prepare for the coming of Jesus until they see Jesus in the clouds and they say, Oh Lord, I'm yours! But if you're not prepared for the close of probation, you will not be prepared for the second coming of Jesus. We need to prepare for the close of probation. And no one knows the day or the hour when it will close. Go with me to Revelation chapter 22, where this idea is uh, fleshed out, where this idea is developed, this idea of the close of probation and in the context of the sanctuary before Jesus comes. Revelation chapter 22. There are three ideas that I want us to notice here in Revelation chapter 22. 
verse 10. It's speaking about the book of Revelation. It says there in verse 10, And he said to me, the angel is speaking to John, Do not seal the words of the prophecy of this book. What does that mean, don't seal the words of the prophecy of this book? Can a message still come from the book and still be understood if it's not sealed? Sure. So in other words, don't seal the book, don't close the book. Because a message needs to come from the book. Can people be saved while the, while the book is still imparting its message? Absolutely. So in verse 10, probation is open. Because it says, do not seal the words of the prophecy of this book. But then it says, for the time is at hand. The question is, what time is at hand? The next verse tells us what time is at hand. Is there a time coming, folks, when the book of Revelation will no longer impart a saving message? Absolutely. Where everybody's case will have been decided based on how they react to what we find in the book of Revelation. Absolutely. This is the reason, we're going to read it in a moment, this is the reason why God pronounces a, a tremendous blessing and a terrible curse upon those who do not handle the book of Revelation properly. It's a serious matter to preach on Revelation. It's a dangerous thing to add or take away. In fact, Revelation chapter 22, verses 18 and 19 says, For I testify to everyone who hears the words of the prophecy of this book, if anyone adds to these things, God will add to him the plagues that are written in this book. And if anyone takes away from the words of the book of this prophecy, God shall take away his part from the book of life, from the holy city, and from the things which are written in the book. Is it important to understand the book of Revelation properly? Absolutely. Now, it's not easy. It's not like reading Reader's Digest. It requires effort, taxing effort, time, prayer. So you find in verse 10, a message is coming from Revelation. Beware, don't add or don't take away because it's a saving message. But is there a time coming when no longer will you be able to hear a message from this book? The book will be sealed up, so to speak. Yes, notice verse 11, Revelation 22, verse 11. The previous verse has said the time is at hand. Don't seal the book. The time is at hand. What time? The time is spoken of in verse 11. It says, he who is unjust, let him be unjust still. Does that sound pretty definitive? He who is filthy, let him be filthy still. He who is righteous, let him be righteous still. And he who is holy, let him be holy still. Are all cases decided at this point? Will the filthy still be filthy? Will the holy still be holy? Will the righteous still be righteous? Absolutely. By the way, these words, holy, filthy, have to be understood within the context of the sanctuary. This is sanctuary terminology. How do you get clean? Spiritually speaking, you have to take, you have to come in repentance and confession to Jesus, and you have to trust in his merits so that he will forgive you and cleanse you, right? Can we do that today? Can we come to Jesus with our sins, repentant, confessing our sin and trusting in his merits, say, Jesus, please forgive me. Will Jesus cleanse those sins? Will Jesus forgive those sins? He most certainly will. But the time is coming when we won't be able to do that anymore. Where the declaration will be made, he who is filthy is going to continue being filthy. And he who is unrighteous will continue to be unrighteous. All cases will have been decided. And this happens before Jesus comes. You say, how do we know that it happens before Jesus comes? Because verse 12 tells us that after this declaration is made, then Jesus comes to give his reward. Notice verse 12 of Revelation 22. And behold, I am coming quickly, and my reward is with me. Did he already decide what the reward was before he came? 
Yes, because he brings the reward. And behold, I am coming quickly, and my reward is with me to give to everyone according to his work. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end, the first and the last. So there's a sequence here. There's a message coming from the book. Don't seal the book. Don't add or take away. It's a life-saving message. But the time is coming when the filthy will be filthy and the righteous will be righteous. And then Jesus will come to give his what? His reward. The sequence is clear and it's connected with the sanctuary because the sanctuary cleansed people so that they would not be filthy. Are you understanding what I'm saying? By the way, there are two cleansings. One cleansing is the individual cleansing when I come in repentance to Jesus Christ and say, Lord, please forgive my sin. Jesus forgives me and cleanses me. But that sin enters the sanctuary covered by the blood of Jesus. And when my case comes up in the judgment, we're going to study this uh, in the last few lectures of this uh, series. When my name comes up in the judgment, because we all will appear before the judgment seat of Christ, the devil will be there to say, hey, Pastor Board did this and this and this and this. He's a sinner. He belongs to me. And Jesus is going to say, I don't deny that Pastor Board did this and this and this, but there's one thing which you forgot, and that is all of those sins enter the sanctuary by my blood. They are forgiven sins. The sins that enter the sanctuary are forgiven sins. And in the judgment, it's God's purpose to shut the devil's mouth. Don't miss tonight's lecture. <laughs> It's going to be good. I can hardly wait. <laughs> now let's talk a little bit about the coming of the thief. You know, the coming of the thief needs to be understood in two ways. First of all, when the thief comes. And secondly, when you discover that the thief has come. Imagine. An individual who has uh, locked the doors to the house since time immemorial. It's December, cold, windy, and you're under the covers, nice and warm. And you remember, you say, I forgot to lock the door. Oh, I hate to get up. Look, the thief hasn't come for 20 years. You're not going to come tonight. And so you stay under the covers. And while you're sleeping, the thief comes. Do you know he's come? You don't know it, but he comes. And he steals your money. He steals your video camera. He steals everything that's valuable. You get up in the morning, and when you get up in the morning, you discover that your television is gone. Hallelujah. <laughs> what happened to my TV? And then you notice that all of these other things are missing. The thief came, and you didn't know it until you woke up in the morning. So will also the coming of the Son of Man be. Close the, close the probation catches everyone like the coming of a thief. And people will not know that Jesus has closed the door of probation until he's coming on the clouds. But at that time, it is too late. You say, is it biblical to believe that probation closes before destruction comes? Let me give you, the, this is the pattern of the Bible. Let me ask you, did the door of probation close for the Jewish nation before the city was destroyed? It was closed in the year 34, and it was destroyed in the year 70. Did the door of probation close for Babylon before Babylon was destroyed? Remember the handwriting on the wall that expressed doom, and then it was destroyed? Sodom and Gomorrah, was the door of probation closed for them before the destruction came? Yes. Remember the angels, they, they took Lot, and they put him in, and they shut the door. At that moment, the door was shut for Sodom and Gomorrah. Did the door close for Jeru the, before the first uh, destruction of Jerusalem? Was there a ceiling that went on, dividing the righteous from the unrighteous, and then destruction came? Absolutely. So this is a pattern in the Bible. That first of all, there's a judgment. Judgment sentence is pronounced, and then the execution of the sentence takes place later. 
Let me share with you an experience. I lived many years in Colombia. My wife is from Colombia. On November 13, 1985, the city of Armero was buried by an avalanche of mud due to the explosion of the volcano Nevado del Ruiz. You see, the people in the city, they didn't believe that uh, they were ever in danger because there's a, a little, there's a, a river that runs on the western side of the city and they felt that if ever that volcano exploded, that the lava would go down the riverbed. But what they didn't realize is that there was a huge boulder that blocked the, the riverbed and diverted the mud right to where the city was. I was there actually about three years ago and visited this place. They still have that huge rock there that blocked the river. 22,000 people that night died and were buried under the mud. I read an article in the newspaper, one of the Colombian newspaper, newspapers, El Espectador, it was written by Rodolfo Rodriguez Calderón. And what he said in that article showed that all of these people could have survived because they had abundant signs that a disaster was imminent. Let me share some of those signs with you. Eleven months before the disaster, the mountain had begun spewing out smoke. The fluffy snow at the top of the mountain turned into a sheet of ice because of the heat. The water level of the river, rivers daily increased more and more. The cloud of ash and gases that the first day reached 15 feet in height, the second day was 750 feet, and the day of the eruption, the cloud of smoke and ash had reached 16,000 feet. On September 11th, a couple of months before, the earth started shaking on a scale of three, on the Richter scale. The people testified, those few who survived, testified that they could hear the mountain rumbling within. The government had to close the access roads because of constant mudslides that made it impossible to get up to the mountain peak. People said they couldn't keep their houses clean because there was constant ash all over their furniture. They could smell sulfur in the air. And those who survived said that the evening of the disaster, there was this torrential rain around 9 o'clock in the evening and a supernatural darkness. Were there plenty of signs that a disaster was imminent? Absolutely! And yet 22,000 people, including 120 of 124 Seventh-day Adventists, were buried by the avalanche of mud. The question is, could this have been averted? And why wasn't it? Do you know the reason why people decided to stay? Because they chose to believe the testimony of the experts let me give you some other details that were appeared in this article. The town priest, Edgar Efren Torres, came over the radio at 7 p.m. and told the people there is no reason to panic. Please keep calm. The civil defense of Colombia sent out a message by radio also saying there is no reason to be concerned. The bishop of the town, Augusto Osorio, even came out and warned against fanatics who were making it appear like a major disaster was imminent. The mayor of the town said, don't worry, and then skipped town. <laughs> the governor of the state of Tolima later said the disaster could not have been predicted in advance. Colombian scientist Jaime Villega Velasquez affirmed, this volcano is not going to erupt, nothing is going to happen, beware of speculations and exaggerations. The secretary of mines, Ivan Duque Escobar, asserted nothing will happen. Even United States geologist Daryl Hurd 
said it is very unlikely that the cities could be buried by rocks, lava, or mud. And the Regional Emergency Committee that very evening sent out a message that said, don't expect your windows to shatter, don't expect darkness, don't expect uh, lava to run down the mountain, don't expect large, la large layers of ash, among other things. In, in fact, they said, go out and enjoy the spectacular scene. The people did not know that the door had closed until destruction came and took them all away. Because instead of paying attention to the signs, they listened to the experts, just like happened before the flood. I'd like to end by reading a passage from Ellen White that applies directly to us. This is a rather lengthy passage. It's found in volume two of the testimonies, pages 190 and 191. Now let's bring it home to us. She says this, Jesus has left us word. And now she's going to quote Mark 13, 33 to 37. She's going to quote scripture. Jesus has left us word, watch ye therefore, for ye know not when the master of the house cometh at even, or at midnight, or at the cock crowing, or in the morning, lest coming suddenly he find you sleeping. And what I say unto you, I say unto all, watch. And then she's going to comment on this passage, because, you know, you read this where it says, lest coming suddenly he find you sleeping, you say, oh, that's the second coming. It's not the second coming of Jesus. It's the coming of a thief by surprise. Listen to what she comments. We are waiting and watching for the, master, for the return of the Master, who is to bring the morning, lest coming suddenly he find us sleeping. See, the coming here is when we are what? Sleeping, not when we wake up. We say, uh-oh, too late. Now notice what she says. We are waiting and watching for the return of the master who is to bring the morning, lest coming suddenly he find us sleeping. And then she asks, what time is here referred to? Not to the revelation of Christ in the clouds of heaven to find a people asleep. No. But to his return from his ministration in the most holy place of the heavenly sanctuary, when he lays off his priestly attire and clothes himself with garments of vengeance. And when the mandate goes forth, he that is unjust, let him be unjust still. And he which is filthy, let him be filthy still. And he that is righteous, let him be righteous still. And he that is holy, let him be holy still. Somebody once asked me, you know, where does Ellen White get the idea that Jesus is going to change his garments from his priestly garments to his uh, royal kingly robes? And I knew that he was being, uh, this was an Adventist, he was being uh, uh, kind of, uh, how would I say, he was opposed to Ellen White's comment. He was making fun of it. And so I said to him, you know, uh, if you just use a little bit of the brain that God gave you, <laughs> it wouldn't be too difficult to reach the conclusion. He said, what do you mean? I said, well, what function is Jesus fulfilling in the sanctuary today? So, well, he's high priest. So how is he clothed? Well, as a high priest, of course. I said, and when he returns again, how is he clothed? Revelation 19 says that he's clothed as king of kings and lord of lords. So sometimes before, sometime before he comes clothed as king of kings, he must have changed. It's that simple. She continues saying, now listen to what she says to us. When Jesus ceases to plead for man, the cases of all are forever decided. This is the time of reckoning with his servants. To those who have neglected, notice the word she uses, to those who have neglected the preparation of purity and holiness, which fits them, to be waiting once to welcome their Lord, the sun sets in gloom and darkness and never rises again. Probation closes. Christ's intercessions cease in heaven. This time finally comes suddenly upon all. 
and those who have neglected, notice again, it's not rejected, those who have neglected to purify their souls by obeying the truth, are found sleeping. They became weary of waiting and watching. Notice, weary. They became indifferent. In regard to the coming of their master, they longed not for his appearing. Do you long for his appearing? She says they longed not for his appearing and thought there was no need of such continued persevering watching. They had been disappointed in their expectations and might be again. They concluded that there was time enough yet to arouse. They would be sure, now listen carefully, they would be sure not to lose the opportunity of securing an earthly treasure. It would be safe to get all of this world they could. They forgot about their church budget. <laughs> and in securing this object, they lost all anxiety and interest in the appearing of the master. They became indifferent and careless as though his coming were yet in the distance. But while their interest was buried up in their worldly gains, the work closed in the heavenly sanctuary and they were unprepared. So what is the message of Jesus? After he spoke about his coming, and the closing of the door and his coming, he said we need to watch. We need to pray. We need to be ready. We need to be faithful in using the gifts that he has given us. All of the parables he gives afterwards tell us what we need to do in the light of the fact that probation will close. Christians who are teaching that we're going to be raptured out of the world before the tribulation will be found in the tribulation without any shelter or any preparation. And among that group will be many Adventists who lost anxiety over his coming. 